then I'll pray. How's that sound? It says, Where was thou? And this is a God talking to Job. Where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest, or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened, or who hath laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy, or who shut, who shut up the sea with the doors, and when it break forth as if it had been issued out of the womb? When I made the cloud the garment thereof, and the thick darkness a swaddling band for it, and break up for it my decreed place, and set bars and doors, and said, Hitherto, shall the, hitherto shalt thou come, but no farther, and here shall that thy proud waves be stayed. Hast thou commanded the morning since thy days, and caused the day spring to know his place, that it might take hold upon the ends of the earth, that the wicked might be shaken out of it? It is turned as clay to the seal, and they stand as a, stand as a garment. And from the wicked their light is withholden, and the high arm shall be broken. Has thou entered into the springs of the sea, or has thou walked in the search of the depth? Have the gates of death been opened unto thee, or has thou seen the doors of the shadow of death? Thus pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I, help, I pray you would just give me help. The words that try to preach this message, Lord, I pray you give us grace and glory as we had preached or as we had sung a little bit ago. And Lord, do a work in our hearts as only you can do. Prepare us for the Lord's Supper that's coming. And Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Uh, the perfections of God. Life is not always easy, and you know that. And life wasn't always easy for Job, but in fact, it's not easy for any one of us. But we've been coming through with all the struggles and all the hardships of Job, and he struggled with his feelings. He struggled with his family. He struggled with, I mean, it's, you name it, there was nothing that Job didn't struggle with. But particularly as we come down toward the end of it, we see how Job particularly struggled with his faith. And you say, he struggled with his faith? Well, yeah, he struggled with his faith. I mean, I think many people, many of us, if we're honest with ourselves, a lot of us have struggled with our faith. And Job was no exception, even though that he was a good man and he loved the Lord as God with all of his heart, with all of his mind, and with all but the best way he knew how to love the Lord. He gave his all to, to God, and yet he still struggled with his, his faith. He struggled with the idea of God is so good. How come all these situations keep happening unto me that I keep... Uh, having to call into mind how I lost my family, I lost my finances, I lost my whole, everything that was good in life, and I didn't even deserve it. It's not like I went out of the way. It's not like I've committed some atrocious sin. It's not like I went out and murdered somebody. It's not like I went out and stole from somebody else. I didn't commit adultery. I, I, Lord, I don't know why all this is happening unto me. And so all these, this is an inward struggle in, in, his, in his soul as he's fighting with it, but you know what? I'm glad that God is patient with us. I'm glad that no matter how we feel, God still loves us whether we see it or not. And, uh, you know, the devil has a, a way of trying to deceive us and try to make us think that God is not good, that God doesn't care what we're going through. But you know what? The devil is a liar. During the whole ordeal when Job was put to the test by the devil, when he was provoked by his friends, when he couldn't find any relief, God was seen to be silent at least at least in his word, he's looking through and everything that Job knew about God. And it's not like he has the Bible like you and I have. It's not like he could flip over to Philippians 4.13 and say, Yeah, I know that I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. It's not like he can go to Romans 8.28 and says, I know all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are thee called according to his purpose. He didn't have these verses within his Bible, the things that he has. It's just stuff that's been handed down. Uh, in that short bit of time that God had created man. That's all that he had. You know, it's, we've been so blessed in our day and age with the things that we have. Oftentimes actions will speak louder in words. You see, God may have not spoken exactly in, in the verbal communication to Job. It's not like he went out and thundered down from heaven and said, Job, I'm up here, and Job, I'm still in control. He didn't do that. But I believe that he showed Job that he was still, still active and still there for him, just in his actions. You know, there's many times where our actions speak louder in words, and, and I'm so grateful when, when Joseph Daniel Funkhauser was born on Saturday, right? 
And, uh, you know, I fully expected to come here on Sunday and preach, and I told you that, but, you know, I didn't know when he was going to be born. It was all in God's timing, and yet I could call upon Brother Kuhn and Brother Willis and call them up and ask them, hey, will you teach Sunday school for me? Will you preach for me? And, and you know how they showed love to me? They didn't question me. They didn't say, you know what, you know, I don't have time. They just went ahead and do it, did it. They took care of it, and I, had to, I didn't even have to worry about it. I didn't have to wonder about what's going on at church. I didn't even have to worry about if you want to show up or not. Hey, that's the way that your actions speak louder than words. Whether you're a door greeter, whether you're like Brother Sheely, Brother Kuhn out there cutting grass, or Brother Adams, many of you were out here doing the, the mowing ministry and, and various other ministries that you do. That's how you show love uh, for me and for other people within the church. And, and your actions are speaking volumes because of the work that God has done within your heart. Because of what God has done within your heart. We worry about people wanting to come see Joey right away. And, and you know, it's kind of a real fear of pregnancy and labor and all that's really messy. It's not a pleasant sight. So uh, you show love to me and respecting the fact that, you know, we wanted people to wait before you showed up. You know what I mean? And so these are ways that you show love. Even Mrs. Cook, when she filled in for Sunday school this morning. Uh, your actions speak louder than words. And Job couldn't see God, but he certainly did not hear the voice of God. But that didn't change the fact that God had showed a strong love and compassion on Job. And you say, how could he not see the hand of God at work when he professed to love God and he professed to serve God? Well, you see, it's an attitude of the heart. Uh, you see exactly the things that you want to see. There's times where I can go out and I can look at the sunset and I can look at the skies. There's times when a thunderstorm is going on. And, and sure enough, I can say, well, this is the hand of God. And it's so plain and so clear. But you know, sometimes when I have a bad day... I, I'm not really necessarily going out and saying, you know what, this, this is God's doing. It's wonderful in our sight. All the things that God has done, all the words that He's spoken. He's so good to me when I'm having a bad day. The attitude of the heart doesn't necessarily come through, even though that I know that God is active. I know that every child born into the world physically is a miracle of God. I know every soul that's saved by the grace of God when they come and humble themselves here at an altar, whether at home or anywhere else where God has spoken to their heart and shown them that they had a need to be saved and God would save them according to His Word. And, and, and this miracle of new birth comes about. We know that this is the hand of God, but not, not everybody sees it. You know what I'm saying? God wanted Job to have healing. It's not that he didn't look down from he heaven and say, you know what, Job, you deserve to suffer. Job, you've sinned and you, know, I, you deserve this suffering that you're going through. No, he wanted him to have healing. He wanted him to have this hedge about him. He wanted him to feel this, this love of God. He wanted him to have a good home, a perfect home, at least as perfect as we can have it here on the face of this earth. But this is not what Job is getting here at this point in time. Too often we make our life story about us, and we can look there at the very beginning of the book of Job, and we can look at, at, the, at the story and say, you know what, I can understand why Job is upset if we look at it from a humanistic uh, a mindset. You know, Job didn't do anything wrong. He's sacrificing for his children. He loves his children. He's doing all these things right, and, and it doesn't make sense why all these things would happen to Job. We can look at it from the, the mindset of the devil and say, well, you know what, there's much evil and much sin in this world and, and it's so horrible, but we ought to look at it from the mindset of God who's still sitting upon the throne of heaven. He's still in control of everything. And despite how far things get out of our control, God has it in perfect working order. There's nothing outside of His control. And it's everything we know. Our lives are for His glory. This world is for His glory. Uh, and this is really what we're going to get to talk about here in just a few minutes. Everything that's going on, God is working out for His glory. And sometimes when we cry out unto God and we say, Lord, how come this hasn't happened yet? And the Lord's sitting back up in heaven and He said, you know what? It's going to come, but it's got to be in my timing. It's going to come, but it's going to be my way. And it's not the fact that I don't love you, but I'm still in control. I still love you. I still love you. Isaiah 49, verses 15 through 16, I was preaching on eternal security this morning. I didn't mention this verse uh, for a reason, but Isaiah 49, verses 15 and 16 says, Can a woman forget her sucking child? 
that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb. Yea, they may forget, yet I will not forget thee. You know, it's hard to think of a mother who would forget her child. But he says, even if a mother has forgotten her child, I'll never forget you. He says, Behold, I've, I've graven you upon the palms of my hands, and your walls are continually before me. You know, there's no way that I'll forget about you. And we're frail, we're fickle, we're forgetful. We may be prone to forget about God and His goodness, but that doesn't change the fact that His goodness is still real. And so God lays it out for Job in, in, in words, and He lays it out for us too in this text. And we must trust God because of His infinite love for us as revealed all, all around us. And uh, like I was mentioning there at the very beginning, it's sort of a disclaimer. Uh, this is just what, what things I want to give you tonight. It's not in a commentary. I don't think you'll find it anywhere. It's just how God has worked in my heart and shown me, hey, this, this is what I want you to see. And I can look down through Job 38 and 39 and say, yes, I know God is wonderful in creation. Yes, God is strong. God is mighty. And, and all. But God is trying to do something for Job. And He's trying to show him His love. He's trying to show him compassion. He's trying to correct him. He's trying to bring him to a right understanding because he's, he's not thinking clearly. His feelings are getting in the way. And he's just trying to show Job something very special about himself so much at the end of, of God's communication with Job, he begins to put his ha hand over his mouth and he says, I've spoken without knowledge. And so this is what I'm going to try to get at as I go down through the text. Well, last time we looked at how the Lord speaks to man and the necessity to pay attention when, it's, when God is speaking. And now we'll look at the manner in which God has spoken that describes His perfections. We've read here verses 4 down through 17. And no doubt the greatest thing that God has ever done is the act of creation. I mean, none of us can do exactly what God has done when He speaks into existence. He says, let there be light, and light was formed into the world. He calls, he calls the, the sun and moon and the stars. He creates them and it's just a spoken word. It's not like he has to work very hard at making it happen. And he makes the sun and the moon come up at different times and he sets up times and seasons. And uh, that's the reason why we have summer, winter, you know, fall, autumn. I mean, all these things. Fall is autumn, I know. He creates the plant life. He creates the animal life. I mean, none of us have been able to do that. He creates an ocean. He separates the firmament from, from the sky, from the heavens, from the, from the firmament of the, of the ground. And, and, and I can't explain that. And He separates the, the, the seas from the rivers, from the oceans, and, and, and all the salt content. And, and God was perfect and, and wondrous in creating all this. And He creates this great big huge fish called a whale that swallows Jonah. He creates a small fish, a trout that we're able to enjoy that tastes very good. The catfish and all, I mean all the different animals that are there in the ocean. And then He comes at the end of it, the last of all, He creates us. Now, I don't know about you, but I know some of you have done construction, right? When I worked in Pennsylvania, and I'm sitting there and I'm trying to lay a foundation and I'm going by verse 4. He says, Where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth, declare if thou hast understanding? And I remember trying to help out to lay this foundation for this building. And it was a, a metal building, a metal steel building, just similar to this. And it wasn't as long, but it was as wide, but it wasn't quite as long, but it was tall. And I remember getting ready to lay the foundation. We're preparing the ground. We're put in the, we're put in the rocks. We're tying in the root, root rebarb. I got to get that right. Sometimes I can mix rhubarb, rebarb. It sounds the same, you know. <laughs> and when you're tying it in and, and you put the forms in and, and you pour the concrete, I mean, it takes days. I mean, maybe we're just not fast workers, but I know for us it took it took a couple of days. It wasn't a fast process, and then you got to wait for that concrete, the the the, the cure, and, and there's so much involved in that. And God just spoke it in a little, uh, in six little 24-hour days, He created the whole world. And I'm just talking about one little spot in Altoona, Pennsylvania, just some insignificant spot on the face of this earth. It took me days to create this, and God created it in 24 24 hours. You know, is our 
our abilities are so small and, and so frail, but God was able to, to do it in, in this small time. He put the stars and the moon in the sky and He created the seasons. He created all these things. He created, honey, if you're paying attention, He created the sharks and He created the dinosaurs. You know that? He created the snakes, which I'm scared of, and, uh, but he, he created them. You know why He created them? He didn't create the flowers. He didn't create the beautiful roses that we're able to enjoy, the, some of the ones that sit out front, our front door. He didn't create them so He can go out and smell them. He didn't create a, a, a beautiful sunrise so He can go out to enjoy it. He didn't create the water just so we could watch the fish jump outside of the water. And No, He created it for you and I to enjoy. And that ought to humble us because we think so much that, that God doesn't love us and yet He created this whole world for our pleasure, for, for our enjoyment. And there's nothing, nothing else created on the face of this whole earth where God looked, created us out of the dust and the ground and breathed into Him the breath of life and said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. There's nothing else that's ever been created that's created like you and I. And doesn't that show you how much that God cares about us? He says, I've created everything for you, and nothing else is said to be created in God, God's likeness and having God's utmost care and interest. You know, I, I was doing some work when we, we initially moved up here on the parsonage, and you know, I did some work on the electrical sockets trying to get all that fixed and straightened out. I moved the ceiling fan from the, from the bedroom where my mother-in-law is and I moved it out to the living room. And you know, if my family wasn't there to enjoy it, I wouldn't take as much pleasure in it. But the fact of the matter is, I, I put it out there not just so it could be there, not because I just like having a ceiling fan in the living room, though I do like it, but I created it, I put it there, I didn't create it, I put it there for my family to enjoy. God puts things for us to enjoy. And so that's the first point here. Creation. God made all these things for us to enjoy. That shows His love. And in the conscience, verses uh, 18 through, through 30. Well, I want to read verses 18 down through 28. It says, Hast thou perceived the breadth of the earth, and declare if thou knowest it all, where is the way where light dwelleth? And as for darkness, where is the place thereof, that thou shouldest take it to the bound thereof? That thou shouldest know the paths of the house thereof? Knowest thou it? Because thou was then born, or because the number of thy days is great? Has thou entered into the treasures of the snow, or has thou seen the treasures of the hail, which I have reserved against a time of trouble, against a day of battle and war? By what way is the light parted and scattered from the east, from the east wind upon the earth? And who hath divided the water course for the overflowing of the waters, or the way for the lightning? of thunder to cause it to rain on the earth where no man is or on the wilderness wherein there is no man to satisfy the desolate and waste ground and to cause the bud of the tender herb to spring forth. Hath the rain a father or hath begotten or hath begotten the drops of dew? And so God questions Job sometimes about the, the finer details of life and his knowledge of it. He says, Job, you think about the light and you think about the darkness here. Do you know where the light comes from? Do you know where the darkness and do you know where its foundations are, where it originates? Do you know how to make it come out and do you know how to make the sun to shine in all of its glory? Do you know how to make the stars to shine? Do you know how to make the moon reflect the glory of the sun? Do you, Job, do you know how to turn on a light bulb sort of thing? And he didn't even have light bulbs in his time. You see, I don't know anything about light. I don't know anything about uh, how to send rain to, to, to water the, des the desolate wilderness, like he says here in verses uh, 26 and 27. To send rain where there, there's no man dwelling, to where there's nothing there except for a little bitty seed that's just hitting away that no man can see. And he says, I send rain in the middle of the wilderness just to reach this one little seed so it can come forth and bud. And so the light can come down upon it and give it life. And Do you, do you know anything about that? You see, Job, I'm so acquainted with the way that life works. Not only did I create it, I know how to make the, the sun, and, and I know how to make the light to come forth. I've created it. I know how water is formed because I've created it. I know how H2O and all that process comes together. I know the things that you enjoy because I created it, but you want to know something, Job? 
you know, I've created the hairs upon your head, but I'm not worried about your hairs. I'm worried about you. I'm worried about your cares. I'm worried about the things that bother you. You see, the Bible says that, you know, not one sparrow falls from the ground without the Father's notice. He says that, you know, even He takes care of the birds, of the, the fowls of the air, and the flowers of the field. He takes care of all these things, and yet we wonder if God cares about us. And He says, you want to know something? If it comes to one of the brightest, the best flowers, you got some of these groups out here that want to protect the endangered species. And, you know, we, we got to go out and protect this eagle, and we got to protect this dodo bird, and we got to protect this flower, and we got to protect these. And, and you know, want to, want to know God's feeling about it? He says, if I had to choose between that flower or that bird, you know, just let it die, because I don't care about that flower, and I don't care about that bird as much as I care about you and how you're feeling and the things that you're going through. Job, I know that you're thinking about your boils, and I know you're thinking about your family, and I know that you think life is unfair, but you want to know something. I understand what you're going through because I've sent my son to die for you. I know what you're going through. I know everything about you, Job. And we think that God doesn't know we think that he doesn't understand. Just like when we're younger, we think that our, my parents just don't seem to understand why I feel this way. And they're not hearing the words that I'm saying. And they won't listen to me. You know, we've all been there. Sometimes that's the way we treat God. We say, Lord, you, you're not understanding. You're not hearing me. And how come you're not answering this prayer? We well, see, he knows what's best for us. He, he, he has perfect knowledge about everything concerning us. Then he prayed in John 17, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but thou shouldest keep them from evil. God cares about us. In the conduct, verses 31 through 35, a short little passage here. Verses 31 says, Canst thou bind the sweet influences of Pallades, or loose the bands of Orion? Canst thou bring forth Maseroth in a season? Or canst thou guide Arcturus and his sons? Knowest thou the ordinance of heaven? Canst thou set the, the dominion thereof in the, in the earth? Canst thou lift up thy voice of the clouds, or the abundance of water may cover thee? Canst thou send lightning that we may go and say unto thee, Here we are? You know, I got, I got to confess, when I, I look here and I see the Pleiades and I see Orion and I see Maseroth, when I first looked at it, I'm like, you know, I know that there's constellations, I know that there's stars, but it really had no meaning to me initially. I had to actually look this one up, and, and uh, I came across this, this, little, um, this little paragraph. It says, By the sweet influences of Pallades, we understand then in plain language that those, uh, those influences which produced the spring and summer these, it is said, no one can restrain. Orion, a conspicuous constellation with its glittering belt, is best seen toward the close of autumn, just before the coming of winter. It is a southern and wintry sign, and therefore, poetically, the winter is traced to the bands of Orion, and no one is able to loosen the bonds of frost or check the incoming of the cold, or in, in other words, the whole verse asserts that none can stop the revolutions of the, se the, the seasons. And C.H. Spurgeon is the one that, that put that out there. In other words, every, everything that we, we are dependent upon, you know, the farmer can't go out and, and plow and determine the seasons by himself. He can't say, you know what, this, this constellation, Orion, or the Pleiades, they need to come out now or they can't loose the, the bands of Orion is what he's saying here within the text. He can't change the season because he wants it to change. And here Job is going through a tough season within his life and, and he can't change it. He can't alter it. He can't do anything about it other than he can rest and rely upon God because this is what the farmer has to do. He goes and he plows and he puts all the work in and he begins to scatter and sow the seed. He waits for God to do His perfect work all in His own season. He can't do anything but just rest and depend upon God. This is what He's calling us to do is depend upon Him. He says the sweet influences of Pallades. There's different times and seasons when in our lives we don't see like, it doesn't feel like a sweet influence. Sometimes it feels like a bitter cold. Sometimes it feels 
And just like there's a dying away and there's no, no rest and no relief and no, no comfort found in it, just like Job is experiencing here. But we know that there's going to come a new season in Job's life where God's going to change this whole situation around when he begins to repent and say, Lord, you know, I've spoken things that I didn't understand and he makes a sacrifice for his friends. And then God begins to change this whole circumstance. But it was in God's season. It wasn't within Job's power to do these things. You see, we must walk in the light that God gives and trust for Him to change the seasons. Not for us to gripe and complain and say, God, what are you doing? You see, the Bible tells us that the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. we got to walk in the light that He gives us and, and just keep walking by the light one step at a time and say, Lord, I don't know what's going on. Lord, I don't know what's going to happen next. But I trust You with my life. And so he tells them here about the, the conduct, the way we ought to conduct ourselves. Just as God conducts the stars of the sky, He, he conducts the different events in our lives. And they care. And care. Verse 39 of this chapter, 38, chapter 38, verse 39. It says, Will thou hunt the prey for the lion or fill the appetite of the young lions when they couch in their dens and abide in the cover to lie in wait? Who provided for the raven his food and his young, his young ones cry unto God? They wonder for lack of meat. Knowest thou the time of the wild goats of the, goats of the rock bring forth? Or canst thou mark when the hinds do calf? Canst thou number the months that they fulfill? Or knowest thou the time when they bring forth, they bow themselves, they bring forth their young ones, they cast out their sorrows, and their young ones are in good liking, and they grow up with corn, and they go forth and return not unto them. They return not unto them. Verse 4. You know, I'm not brave enough to go out, and I don't think it's a wise thing to go out, and you see the safari hunts. I don't see anybody going out with meat tied around their waist to go try to feed the lions. That's a bad idea, right? Uh, I don't see anybody going out and say, you know, these pesty ravens that are out here, why don't I just go out and take care of them? He says here about the, 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 the wild goats. He says, Job, do you know how long did their pregnancy last? How long did they're carrying their young? When they're going to have their babies? Do you know when it takes place? How it takes place? Do you know any of these things? Apparently it's something that's, that's obscure, that is not observed very much in nature, even though that it happens. And you see, he's talking about things that people were not aware of, and you know, none of us go out of our way to take care of the lions and search out meat for them, but God takes care of them. We don't go out of our way to try to provide food for the ravens and make sure that they're taken care of, but God takes care of them. We don't know the pains and the groanings and all the the suffering here, the, the, the wild, wild goat mother who's trying to deliver her, her baby, her young. But God says, I'm there to help in the delivery room. I've heard it. I, I made sure and they're in good liking. You know, I take care of them. And Job, just because nobody's hearing your groans, just because you don't think anybody understands, just because you think things are going sour, don't think that I don't hear, don't think that I don't understand, don't think that I can't do anything about it because I have a good result that's going to come out of this. You see, I can feed the lions and I can feed the ravens and I can make young come forth and they're going to be good and like, in their liking. I can take care of you, Job. You think nobody cares for you, but I do. You think nobody hears, but I do. Then the conquering, verses 9 through 12. It says, Will thou with a unicorn be willing to serve thee or abide by the crib? Canst thou bind a unicorn with his band in the furrow? Or will he harrow, harrow the valleys after thee? Will thou trust him because his strength is greater? Will thou leave thy labor to him? Will thou believe him? And will he bring home thy seed and gather it to thy barn? Gavest thou the goodly wings unto the peacocks, and wings and feathers unto the ostrich? And so, uh, you know, I don't know what a unicorn looked like in that day. I know today, you know, you get all these different things on TV. I don't think the unicorn looks exactly like how Hollywood has painted it. I don't know exactly what a unicorn looks like, but you want to know something. This is a strong animal. And the best that I can know, if, if you would try to go and try to 
make a rhinoceros or something like that and try to make him do what you want. Good luck in trying to make that happen. Those beasts are strong and they're mighty and they've been known to tip over vehicles and it's not a pleasant sight. But God says, I have them under my control and under my power and under my dominion. And guess what? I can make them do what I want them to do. They're, they're under my control, Job. But can you make them go out? Can you make them gather in food? Can you use them to plow the fields? Can you use them to... Can you trust them? And the answer would be obviously, no, he can't do any of that. You know... God has given us dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowls of the air, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the face of this earth. He's given us dominion over these things. But I wish one thing, I wish we could have dominion over our own souls. Um, but He's given us a free, a free will, hasn't He? You say, well, didn't He give an animal a free will? No. But He's given us a free will. You see, we have ability to re rebel against God if we want to. We have ability to, to disregard God's laws and God's commands. We have ability to do all these things. Uh, sad to say. But the animals just have an animal instinct. They just do what comes natural to animals. They might have a learned behavior. Some of them are smart. Some of them are able to do incredible things. You know, you look at the, the different... Animals just like the ones that they use the canines to go out and help the police force. You think of the, the dogs, I'm thinking of Paw Patrol because my son Elijah, you know, he watches Paw Patrol. And I'm going through the different animals that they got there. So like the canine that goes out and he helps and searches out the lost and found. And Anyway, just forgive me on that. They might have some smarts to them to be able to learn some of these behaviors. But He's given us a free will and uh, in order to love and to trust God. Psalm, Psalm 19 goes like this. In Psalm 19, let's see. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament declareth His handiwork. Day unto day other is speech and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. And their lines is going out to the end of the world, and their voice, or their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which cometh forth as a bridegroom to, to coming out of his chamber, and as a, rejoices as a strong man to run a race. And uh, he says, his circuit is to the end of heaven, and his circuit is to the end of the world. And he said, there's nothing hid from the heat thereof. And he's talking about the sun there. But then it comes down to our part. And it begins to talk about what we're governed by, and how we're governed by God. And we're governed by His statutes, we're governed by His judgments, and He says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimonies of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. And He goes down all through the list how we are to be governed by God. And you know what? We rebel. And we kick against God. But yet these are the things that govern us. These are the things that keep us in check. And so there's a, the, the conquering, God's dominion. He's given us a free will and then He's created instinct. Uh, verses, chapter 39, verses, let's look at verse 15. And He forgetteth that the foot may crush Him. Talking about the ostrich, verse 14, where it says, Which leaveth their eggs in the earth and warmeth them in the dust, and forgetteth that their foot may crush them, or that the wild beast may break them. Go down to verse 19. Has thou the, given the horse strength, or has thou clothed his neck with thunder? Canst thou make him afraid as a grasshopper, the glory of his nostrils terrible? He pauleth in, pauleth, in, pauleth in the valley, and rejoiceth in the strength. He goeth on to meet the armed man. He mocketh in fear, and is not affright, neither turneth he back from the sword. The quiver rattleth against him, and the glittering spear, and the shield. And he swalloweth the ground, and the fierceness of rage, and neither believeth he that it's the sound of the trumpet. He's not afraid uh, uh, of the battle. And so he begins to talk about the ostrich, how he doesn't have any knowledge. Nobody would necessarily put their eggs in a way. If a mother bird would put their eggs on the ground so they could be crushed by an animal or so they could be taken by a lizard, that doesn't make any sense. No man would go out and you know, do as this horse here and just run straight into battle because it doesn't make any sense. God hasn't endowed them with a certain sort of 
knowledge and wisdom that he's given us to commune with God. And so in all of this is really what I'm coming down to. God has created Job in a particular way to show his love and his mercy unto him. He wants Job to understand, you know what Job, I've created all these things for you to enjoy. I didn't create you so you can suffer. I didn't create you so you can uh, hurt all the time. I've created you with a free will. I've created you with knowledge. I've created with you with understanding. I know about your cares. I know more about you than, than I know about the animal. I mean, well, he, he, he knows about everything, doesn't he? Perfectly, completely. But he cares more about us, is what I'm trying to say. He cares more about us. Because you know what? Christ didn't come to die for the Son. Christ didn't come to die for a fish. Christ didn't come to die for an angel. Christ didn't come to give His life for a beast of the field. No, He came to give His life for you and I. And that's really the, the fruit of the whole matter here. Job sees God as unfair, but you know what? God has made you and I so particularly special. You know, I, I love my, both of my sons unconditionally with all my heart, with everything within me, and I'd do anything for them. You think that God wouldn't do more for you and I who are His children? He'll do anything for us. Job, I've created everything for you, and I know all about you. Job, trust in my timing. I know that you don't think things are working out, but trust my timing for you, and God will meet your needs, and He'll give you... Uh, a free will in order to love and trust Him. He's created you superior to the animals with knowledge and wisdom. The Bible says, He that spared not His own Son, but delivered Him up for us all, how shall we not with Him also freely give us all things? Isn't it amazing how God loves us? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank You so much for Your love and tender mercy. Lord, I know sometimes we can doubt and sometimes we think that uh, things are not going the way that we want to. We think that you don't care. We struggle with our faith. We struggle when we don't see things that we want to see. But Lord, we know that you're ultimately in control and we know that all things are working together for your good. And we know that you loved us so much that you would do anything for us if you wouldn't Withhold your own son, Lord. Why would you withhold anything else good from us? And Lord, help us to trust you unconditionally. Help us to walk in your steps. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Are you saved today? Are you doubting in your faith of God's love and tender care? Let's stand to our feet. I want to do blessed assurance like we did this morning. You remember what page that was? 143. Let's go to 143. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. We want to get ready to go into the, the Lord's Supper. You know, I always look forward to this time and celebrate what the Lord has done for us. And we look through of 
The ordinance has been given unto us, and we're able to celebrate this time and time again, as often as you will, until the Lord come. Uh, it's a time of gathering together as a family of, of Christ. It's a time of uh, remembering what the Lord has done, and a time of expectation, uh, time of examination for ourselves. I mean, this time of rejoicing. Uh, it's a special time for you and I, and, and it's encouraging. I want you to go over to Luke chapter 22. Luke 22, verse 7. Luke 22, 7. It says, Then came the day of unleavened bread, when the Passover must be killed. And they sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare us the Passover that we may eat. And they said unto him, where wilt thou that we prepare? And he said unto him, Behold, when you are entered into the city, there shall a man meet you, bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he enter, and you shall say unto the good men of the house, The master said unto thee, Where is the guest chamber, where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? And he shall show you a large upper room furnished, and there make ready. And he went and found as he had said unto him, and they made ready the Passover. And when the hour was come, he sat down with the twelve apostles with him, and he said unto him, With desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he said, And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And then he took the bread and he gave thanks and break it and he gave unto them, saying, this is my body which is given for you, and this do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup of the supper, saying, Take this cup. Uh, this cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you. But behold the, man of, behold, the hand of him that betrayeth me is with me on the table. And truly the Son of Man goeth as it was determined, but woe unto that man by whom he is betrayed. And we know that afterwards Judas had left, and then they partook of the Lord's Supper, as given there. The Passover was the time they remembered the deliverance of God, how He brought them out of the Exodus. And God had brought them out with a strong hand, with an outstretched arm, and He did these many different, ten different plagues, and eventually the Pharaoh would say, you know, enough's enough, I've had enough, I can't take any more. And God delivered the children of Israel. But before they did, they instituted the Passover. And He said, I want you to kill a lamb, I want you to put the blood upon the doorposts. And if when I see the blood, I want to pass. I'll, I'll pass over you. And so they instituted this Passover. And because of the blood, they were free. You know, they were passed over because of the blood. And that's you know, when the Lord sees the blood, the blood of Christ on our hearts. You know, he, pass, he, well, he welcomes us home is really what He does. Because we have His blood. We're one of His children. You know, for my son, well, he actually has his mother's blood, type O positive. But, you know, he has my blood. You know, my wife constantly, constantly reminded me he has my sin nature. But anyway, I have my father's blood, the divine nature that God has given unto me. I'm just digging a hole for myself. But he's, I, I got the blood of the father. And because I'm one of his children, I know that he's going to bring me home. But he says, I want you to do this ever so often to remember what I've done for you on the cross. How I've taken away every one of those sins and, and, and how I've redeemed you and how I've set you free and, and how I'm coming again to receive you unto myself. And so he looked from the Passover to the Exodus until the time when the Messiah should come. In Galatians chapter 4 verse 4 it says, But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoptions of son. And it's because of Jesus Christ coming that I'm considered a son. And he wants us to remember this particular time. Now go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 you know, The Lord's Supper is for those who have been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. It's not for anyone who's been who is unsaved, you know, we're naturally unsaved. We must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shall be saved, is what the Scripture tells us. And so it's a time for saved people to gather around this, this table 
and celebrate it with the Lord. Verse 28 says, But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. And for this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened to the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. And so he tells us there, you know, before we get into taking the cup, we ought to examine ourselves. Examine what the Lord has done and how He's redeemed us. How He's set us free. And, and are we walking in a way that's pleasing to the Lord? In other words, are we in fellowship with God? I'm not saying, have you, have you sinned two seconds ago or have you sinned an hour ago? If you've done that, I hope you, you, you confess it. But I'm saying, have you done... Are, are you... In, it's for those who are right standing with the church. Saved, baptized, and uh, part of the church is who it's for. And these are the ones who were gathered around the table and who we celebrate with. Like I said, it's a relating time, a remembering time, an expecting time, an examining time, and a rejoicing time. So I want to call the men forward who are going to uh, pass out the, the elements here. The grape juice representing the shed blood of Jesus Christ. It isn't the blood of Jesus Christ, but it, it symbolizes the blood of Jesus Christ that He shed for us on our behalf. Then the bread that symbolizes His body that was broken for us by His stripes, we are healed, the Bible tells us. And as we partake, we need to partake together. And so we want to pass out these elements. We want to pray. We'll pass it out and hold it and partake together. And as we're waiting, we just reflect upon the goodness of God. Reflect upon what He's done for you. <coughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Brother Coon, would you pray? Father, we thank you for another time to come together. And Father, fresh on our mind. It should be at all times. Remember, not only the first week and first Sunday of each month, but Father, every day. Father, as we live, and Father, as we know that we're not perfect, but by your grace, by the shedding of your Son's blood, wash our sins away. Father, makes us fit for the kingdom of heaven. Father, we thank you for that great love. He paid the price that we couldn't pay for ourselves. And Father, help us to be faithful. Help us to love you as we ought to and be thankful for our salvation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
have received of the Lord, that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take heed, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Let's partake. Get ready for the grape juice now. Again, the shed blood of Jesus Christ. For the sins of the whole world. Brother Adams, would you pray? Father, we can't totally understand that your blood would cleanse us all humanity from sins, past, present, and future. But you did. Because you created us as your children. And we can't thank you enough, Father. One day we'll understand all these things, but today we're kind of semi-blind. But we know, Father, your love. Your love is the greatest love in all the world. Thank you again, Father, for that love, that sacrifice. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. After the same manner also he took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, This cup is, ne is the New Testament in my blood, this do ye as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's drink. Amen. Now the question is, are you expecting the Lord to come? You know, this might be our last, last Lord's table. And that would be something great, wouldn't it? I mean, I'd be looking forward to that. I am expecting the Lord to come, and I hope it's tomorrow, but, you know, if not, He'll just give me another, another opportunity to preach. And we're able to preach through the partaking of the Lord's Supper because we, we show the world what the Lord means to us, you know, and what He's done. And uh, hopefully you show it through your life, too, that your life is a living testimony to a lost and dying world. But, uh, you know... I always try to sing a hymn before we leave out to the Lord's Supper here. And I always like hymn number 170, so if you'll stand to your feet, and we'll sing number hymn number 170, Hallelujah, What a Savior.
five. Brother Frank, would you dismiss us in a word of prayer?